Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. Hey guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that shows you how to get the most out of your high intensity training and start and grow your strength training business. My former guests include the who's who in high intensity training, including people like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Jim Flanagan, paleo pioneers Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, zero carb carnival Dr. Sean Baker, successful strength training entrepreneurs like Luke Carlson and Adam Sickerman, high intensity training bodybuilders, sports scientists, experts in business productivity, minimalist adventure races and everything in between. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to talk to you quickly about the Corporate Warrior Membership. This is a blueprint I've designed to help you grow your high-intensity training business, including exclusive how-to content, monthly Q&As of experts, very high-grade community full of thought leaders and high-intensity training entrepreneurs, savings on high-intensity training products and services, and private coaching from me to make sure you get maximum results. If you're interested in that, please go to Corporate Warrior dot co forward slash membership and apply for the waiting list. Also, I am on Patreon. So if you fancy supporting the podcast and the blog, but you know, you're not interested in perhaps starting a high intensity training business, but you enjoy the content I create, I would very much appreciate it if you took five seconds to go over to patreon.com forward slash corporate warrior and consider providing a small donation. Um, And in return, I will give you various exclusive Patreon surprises. I have absolutely no idea what those will be at this time, um, but I certainly have some ideas and we'll be uh, garnering feedback from you guys as to what I can provide um, to you guys on the Patreon platform. But yes, I appreciate it if you could go to patreon.com forward slash corporate warrior and donate a very small amount would be, yes, very helpful. My guest today is former Discover Strength Director of Operations, Brandon Yonker. Uh, Brandon started as a personal trainer at Discover Strength and spent eight years there helping to make that business what it is today. Discover Strength is a fast-growing personal training business and its studios are among the highest volume revenue training facilities in the United States. When I was over at the Resistance Exercise Conference in 2018, um, I was set to actually talk to Brandon about one of the studies that uh, Discover Strength helped conduct uh, this year. Uh, But unfortunately, we didn't get to talk and I was very, very upset. So I said to Brandon, you know what, when I'm back in the UK, let's schedule a podcast and, uh, and, and, and do a podcast together and talk about the research that you've done. He was very, very up for that. Um, you can email Brandon at brandon at yonker, that's J-O-N-K-E-R-C-C dot com. 
In this episode, we spend most of the conversation discussing a study conducted by Discover Strength called uh, Neither Repetition Duration Nor Number of Muscle Actions Affect Strength Increases Body Composition, Muscle Size, or Fasted Blood Glucose in Trained Males and Females. And this was published alongside Luke Carlson, uh, Wayne Westcott, and doctors James Steele and James Fisher. I should say Dr. Wayne Westcott, of course. Um, but this is a really interesting study. It's from what I understand, there's not a lot of evidence um, that looks into the uh, the effects of different repeti- repetition durations. There is some which actually, uh, I think there is one meta-analysis which actually points to a different outcome, um, which is that repetition duration does affect these things. But it, it would seem that uh, there's not much in the way of um, controlled studies perhaps on this uh, on this subject. So it's nice to see um, some more evidence being being created. Um, in this conversation, we spend most of, uh, most of the time digging into the details of this study. And we talk about how the findings can help inform personal training recommendations and improve client compliancy, as well as also uh, making changes and improving your own training uh, routines and helping you uh, adhere to training over the long term. We also talk about tips for running a successful fitness business operation, including the importance of creating an exercise menu to significantly improve the quality of your service. We we talk about the value of a formalized shadowing process to improve your trainers and client retention and how to set expectations to optimize internal communication, productivity, and much, much more. And without further ado, and now I give you Brandon Yonker. Brandon, welcome to Corporate Warrior. Well, thank you so much, Lawrence. I uh, appreciate you having me. Um, And and I really have a a strong respect for what you've done, uh, not only for this podcast, but for our industry and really this subsector of the industry specifically. So uh, I guess thank you for having me, first of all. Well, I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, really enjoying being part of this, this industry and doing my best to try and help the um, you know the participants in strength training and 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 also the the businesses out there as well, and um, you know we we recently met for the second time at the the resistance exercise conference uh, in Minnesota, which was a lot of fun. And um, and as part of that, I was obviously interviewing people, um, and unfortunately that meant I missed some of the presentations, which I was quite. Uh, a little bit annoyed about, but it was really hard to try and get both things achieved. So, so with that, I unfortunately missed your presentation, which was on the results and application of repetition duration and the recommendations from that. Um, and so I'd love to hear you just talk about that um, and maybe set the scene, like what that, um, that kind of um, experiment or research was, why that was conducted, um, how you did it, what the methods were, and, and what the findings were for that. Sure, sure. And and if you want to interject at any point, feel free and, and stop me. And I'm, I'm uh, happy to pick any questions you have apart as we go through. Cool. So this was our, our fifth study, and it's currently in review right now. And we were looking at um, different types of repetition duration. And we really wanted to compare, I guess, your standard high intensity rep, you could call it, uh, one of a, a two second concentric, a four centric, eccentric. Um, and then compare that to, I guess you'd call it a standard super slow protocol. Um, sometimes it's, uh, I guess, not quite okay to use that that term, but th- 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 that's the speed we use. It would be a 10-second concentric and a 10-second eccentric. And then our final group um, was actually a 30-second eccentric followed by a 30-second concentric, and then again a 30-second eccentric after that. So those were the three testing groups. Um, as far as study design, we used a randomized controlled design um, with single-blinded, and um, all every single one of the groups trained to true momentary muscular failure. So if it was the 2-4 the group, for example, group one, um, they worked just to utter concentric fatigue, and then stopped right there. And if they were in the 10-10 group, they again worked to concentric fatigue. And then for the 30-30-30 group, or that third group, um, what we did was if or to make sure they were at true concentric failure, once they completed the 90 seconds of work, that being the 30-second eccentric, the 30-second concentric, and then the 30-second eccentric again, we had the individual 
attempt a 2-4 cadence rep, and majority of the time they were not able to complete even one, thus indicating they were at concentric fatigue. But if they were not quite at that point, then we had them continue with 2-4 paced uh, repetitions until they did reach failure, and then, of course, adjusted the load accordingly next time so they did fail within that um, the, the one of those three 30-second phases. Um, when we collected data for this, we did it really in, in two different three-month periods, um, and that's simply from a, a client perspective. We got about we wanted to have about 60 participants total, and so um, when we first started promoting it, we didn't quite get the number we wanted, so we shut it down for a couple months and then um, picked it up again uh, later in, in April. Uh, the, the duration of the study was was 10 weeks long. And as far as uh, rest in between workouts, our subjects had to have a minimum of 48 hours, but more often than not, they were at the 72-hour range. But from an applicability perspective, um, we allowed a minimum of, of 48 or said they had a minimum of 48. Um, one of the unique things about this study and really all the studies we've done that's super important to note is they were all had one-on-one -on -one supervision by a certified exercise physiologist. And in my opinion, that's one of the biggest strengths of this. Sometimes you see, or a lot of times you see studies, especially within our field, that um, are group supervised or it's one to, you know, 10 or one to 15 um, or it's someone manning a weight room where everybody's just going through on their own. This was not that way. This is one trend trainer, one client, one subject that is taking that person directly through the workout. So the, as far as um, general setup and design, that's that's kind of that's kind of it. How many how as, many participants did you have? Sorry if you uh, I might miss that bit in total. Yeah, so we had 60 participants total. Total. Um, and when, uh, excuse me, it was actually 62 total. It was 26 males and 36 females. Uh, throughout the process, um, we had three people drop. So we had one female that became pregnant and did not want to continue. We had another female who just decided that it wasn't for her and she didn't want to stick with the protocol. And then we had um, one male that just didn't like the intervention. I think he was in the 30-30-30 group and he said, I don't want to do this. So he <laughs> dropped from it. So the, the final group, yeah, it was just... just yeah, it was just kind of interesting. So we said, okay, that's fine. Um, so final group numbers were for the 2-4 group, we had 18 people, which was 7 males and 11 females. For the 10-10 group, or the second group, we had uh, 20, 10 and 10, 10 males, 10 females. And then for the 30-30-30 group, we actually had 21, 8 males and 13 females. Um Age ranges from here was 25 to 56, so a large range. Um, all the clients were current Discover Strength clients, so they had been training with us for at least six months. Um, and they were all physically active at that time. Um, they were also free from any medical conditions um, or anything that would prevent them to perform, obviously, any of the exercises. And then we had written consent uh, with everybody before we actually started the, the study, of course. So awesome. So what were the what were the outcomes? What were the findings? So. Yeah, this is actually quite fascinating. Um, we, we tested really three different areas. We tested muscle performance using predicted one RM. And then we looked at body composition, um, and we looked at this in numerous different ways. We used the bod pod to assess uh, body fat percentage, and then we did some skin fold measurements and some circumference measurements um, to measure uh, both arm and thigh muscle area, and then lean mass and a segmental analysis. And then we looked at um, fasted glucose as well. And so if you look at those three different areas, this is what we found. From a muscle performance perspective, from a strength perspective, using the predicted 1RM, um, we we saw no significant differences between groups, but there were significant differences within those groups. Okay? From a body composition perspective, body fat, lean mass, arm and thigh, muscle area, we saw no significant differences between or within groups. And then from a fasted blood glucose analysis perspective, we saw no significant differences within those groups as well. 
Okay, so really, if if you boil it down, what that tells us and what we must fundamentally understand about what this research says, whether you are a super slow person by trade or you believe in the two four more of a two four standard high intensity protocol of repetition, or or you do some variant of that, the the fundamental take home here is that repetition repetition duration. And the number of rep- or muscle actions, I would say, performed does not impact strength adaptations from a, a practical perspective. It simply does not impact. It doesn't matter what we do. If we want to do a 10-10 cadence, if we want to do a 2-4 cadence, um, we can see those same benefits to the muscular structures, um, and that really doesn't impact it from a, re- a number of repetitions that we do perspective. And frankly, I, I know we touched on this before we started, um, from a from a practical perspective, from a prescriptive perspective, if you will, that gives trainers and really business owners a ton of autonomy. You know, if, if somebody wants to do a, a, a 10-10 cadence, or for whatever reason, maybe the 10-10 cadence feels better than the 2-4 cadence on a given exercise, or a 30-30-30 cadence for that matter, we have the autonomy to be able to prescribe that to them as opposed to saying, no, nope, I'm sorry, you have to do it this way, or you have to do it this way. This says, as long as we get to failure, the benefit Benefits to your muscular structures are the are, are the same or very very similar, and, and from a prescriptive perspective, that's extremely reassuring. Yeah, that's really interesting. I remember walking into the room and uh, missing, I think, ninety eight percent of the presentation. And uh, I looked at Ash, my partner, and I said, "She said, uh, she was about to summarize it for me." I looked at her and I said. No difference, right? And she looked at me and went, yeah, you were right. Cause I, and I'm not saying that to boast, um, sure. but I, I predicted before I found out, obviously, the outcomes that there would be no ch- change. I didn't, that was my hypothesis. Um, no. and, and I'm going to guess that maybe you and, and maybe a lot of the people in that room probably had the same view because we know that I think a lot of us in the, this kind of community understand that a lot of these variables don't matter and that failure seems to be one of the only variables that really does matter. Um, I, I, I would say that's true, and, and I would say you're, you're right there, but I also want to like take a step back, and I should have mentioned this at the beginning, that the, the, the point behind this, and when we went out to explore this repetition duration, the point was not to say, oh, well, super slow is not as good as this, or All this right. type of training is not as good as this. It was definitely not that. We just simply wanted to look at the evidence and say, okay, um, let's take a non-biased perspective, okay, an evidence-based approach here, and and just see what the data suggests. And um, again, as I touched on earlier, whether you are a super slow person by trade, or you believe more in the 2-4, or you want a longer repetition duration, like a 30-30-30, or whatever it may be, we just have to understand that coming out of this, at least from the results of this study, repetition speed or duration does it does not matter. So um, I just want to make that caveat that it was not to uh, attack any particular type of training. We just wanted to look at what the re- the research shows. Oh yeah, no, that your your position communicates that quite clearly, and I appreciate you saying that. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's actually quite awesome. Like you were saying just now, the amount of creativity this gives practitioners and personal trainers in terms of the different types of protocols they can use with their clients um, just to figure out, you know, knowing, knowing that they're going to produce very similar outcomes. Um, it's really about finding the one that uh, works the best for that particular client in terms of perhaps compliance or, or, or just that they, you know, whatever cadence they enjoy, they enjoy using the most. Um, but it's, exactly, exactly. But it's, uh, it's funny because, um, I'm sure there are some people point out maybe there's some flaws in this study. I mean, one of the things that comes to mind is the sample size, you know, it was 60 people. Um, do you think that really, you know, to make this more conclusive, you need a bigger sample or are there any other thoughts you've had or feedback you've had on the study design flaws in this at all? Yeah, you know, I actually think personally that the number of participants is actually one of the bigger strengths of this study. I mean, you see studies all the time in our field that, um, you know, they come out with 10 to 15 participants and we have people that, um, or I shouldn't say we have people, there are people that say, no, that's a 
definitively true, and then that's exactly what we should start moving forward with, you know. And even though it was a very sample, a very small sample size, so actually our number of subjects, I think, is one of the the strengths of this study, and that's why we really pushed to get to that 60 number. Um, in our first intake, we had about 25 or 30, and we just said, um, in going back and forth with Luke and James and James, we just said, no, let's let's take a little bit longer to get this out, and let's actually um, push for for, for those 60 participants. So f- from a, a number of people perspective, I think that's actually very, um, a, a, a very strong piece of the study. So, yeah, um, I think you're uh, right. <laughs> I, I was, uh, I would, sorry, Brandon, just to say, I, uh, I, I just forgot for a second, just you're right, how small the sample sizes are in strength training uh, research. Sure. Um, you're absolutely right. So actually, yeah, I'd say that is one of the, perhaps one of the strengths, but sorry, go on. I don't know if you're going to elaborate on things you, you may have improved in a future study or, or, or any other flaws that come to mind. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess some of the things that people could critique um, uh, about the study would be that um, we did the same I- intervention, you know, ten times over. So people perform these each, just two workouts, twenty times, and we, you know, we didn't do, we omitted certain exercises, um, and so I guess you could say we didn't tax every possible or didn't use every possible exercise machine. I guess that could be a, a potential limitation or there were certain larger muscle groups that just naturally by the, the, um, the build of the study or the, the outline of the study that were omitted. Um, but I, I would say that that's probably not a huge limitation, but that is one of the critiques that we we've, we've got. Um, uh, contrasting that, I would say one of the, the biggest strengths of this study would be what we call like the ecological validity of the study. OK, so these people and the subjects that were um, in this study were normal, everyday people, just like you or me. And what I mean by that is they were not like, you know, required by a professor to be in the lab and in this study. They, you know, they, they got up early in the morning, they brought their kids to school, they went to work, they endured all the stress of the day, and then they went through this study. So when we talk about applicability and ecological validity, this has a ton of that, whereas other studies are performed more in a controlled lab-based environment where the studies, uh, or the subjects rather, may have uh, advantage or even disadvantage in that scenario. But I do think that due to the real life applicability or ecological validity of this, it makes this study quite a bit stronger in that regard. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, real real validity in the real world, um, which is cool. And I think which is why um, other organizations and, and DS should do more stuff like this um, to, to find out a bit more. Um, do you know if uh, DS or Discover Strength for those listening um, have any more in the pipeline like this at all? They, they absolutely will, for sure. Um, and I, I'm not sure exactly what those studies will look like. We've talked uh, with James and James uh, and Luke as well um, about some general ideas, but um, I don't have concrete, uh, not evidence, just good. I don't know what their next study is going to be, but I definitely know they have plans for a bunch more. Um, just taking a, a quick step back as far as other um, critiques of the study. Sorry, I, I kind of glazed over that. I wanted to get okay. more there. Um, I, I guess one of the other critiques could be there's no nutritional component. So we didn't um, regulate protein intake or caloric intake with anybody, and that could definitely have an impact on the body composition changes or lack thereof that we saw in the study. Um, and I would say that per, per, um, we could have used maybe even a longer repetition duration, so maybe like a 60-second negative or a 60-second positive, just to be a little uh, more all-encompassing. Um, those are really the, the two other big critiques that we've gotten and we've received in the past, um, and that I, I actually do think have some validity. But when it came to um, actually getting this study done and with the environment that we had, we just decided that it was best to um, not – try and regulate the nutritional components and that those three groups were encompassing enough from a time under tension perspective across the three groups. So sorry to kind of get out of order there, but I want to make sure I, I caught no. on that piece because it popped into my head. No, that's fine. I appreciate you being so open about, you know, the critiques. Um, it's, uh, it's cool to see or cool to hear. Um, 
you know, there's a couple of things that come to mind. You know, you hear a lot of people <laughs> in the uh, sort of strength training and, and high intensity training community who will, uh, um, you know, put down super slow and say super slow is less effective. It, you know, people have lost muscle doing super slow and, I'm highly, highly, as I'm sure you are, skeptical of those claims, um, even from people who, you know, really treat their work like an art. You know, there's personal trainers who, um, you know, will claim that, you know, they work with someone. And I, and I appreciate that, you know, it is a big, a big part of strength training is individualizing the, the stimulus and the protocol to the person. But in the context of just looking at repetition duration, it really doesn't look like, um, you know, it, it makes much of a difference whatsoever. And I don't think there's much evidence behind the claim that, you know, super slow is ineffective. I'm just, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, th- I think you're hundred percent right. And I would say that uh, the results from this study only further proved that. And I think um, at least from my experience, the, we almost have like a, a turf board when it comes to different subsectors of high intensity training, which, um, I actually think it's it's pretty sad because I think it's limiting to what uh, to, to I guess the growth of this type of training or to the the spread of evidence based exercise um, because you're essentially fighting against each other as opposed to I guess fighting the good fight if you will so yeah I, I would echo what you said is that um, those claims um, that super slow is you know not as good or on the other side of the coin, super slow is way better, are simply unsubstantiated by the research that we proved here uh, or that we, we saw here, the evidence that, that came out of this study. And um, but I would agree with you that there's there's really no evidence to, to support that. Um, and again, I'll reiterate that from a personal trainer perspective, um, from a business owner perspective, that is awesome because it allows you to not have to be just glued to one type of training or excuse me, one type of repetition duration, which, you know, quite honestly could lead to stagnation and even boredom from your clientele. You know, if somebody comes in, like we saw subjects in this study that just said, I don't want to do 30-30 today, or I don't want to continue with this 30-30-30 protocol. From a prescriptive perspective, of course, not in the study, but from a prescriptive perspective, we can say, okay, totally fine. Let's, let's go with two four cadence. Let's go with 10 10 cadence. Let's go with two 10 cadence. You know, let's mix it up, which hopefully, um, will lead to better client satisfaction, a better client experience, and then greater and long term client retention. Whereas if we were to say, no, 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 you have to do it this way, you have to do a 10 10 cadence, you have to do a two four cadence, and the person says, I don't want to, well, then our answer to that is, you know, either getting a, a battle with them as to why we think they should do it, or they end up leaving. And neither one of those are, are good for business, of course. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, ARX. Are you looking to create a cutting edge, high intensity training facility? Are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. Mike, if you could, give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and use that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. We removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. 
When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance, both positively and negatively 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more, but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the Corporate Warrior podcast to receive an exclusive deal of $500 off shipping and installation off your ARX machines. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the listeners will know that I come from a perspective of, of um, certainly in my own training, of um, having a very, letting the cadence express itself quite organically. And I stole this from Dr. Doug McGuff. You know, I, I am sure you, you guys do this a lot too. You know, I, I, will ha- I will focus on like very smooth turnarounds at either end of the movement. And then I might be, you know, two, three, two to four seconds maybe on the concentric in the middle. Um, and that generally expresses itself to whatever, you know, that might be, I don't know, that might be seven, seven or eight, yeah. eight, or, and then that will obviously, um, go up over time as I fatigue. And then it varies massively between machines, right? Like one thing I noticed when doing the workout with your team, um, your former team at uh, Discover Strength in, um, uh, Minnesota was that you did, uh, apply a lot of these advanced techniques and, differing cadences for all the different exercises and I actually really enjoyed that and I didn't find that I was ever (laughs) it never felt like I was getting a break Um, and I also think that's partly because the machines that you use and I think it was mostly um, correct me if I'm wrong but in that facility I think it's mostly Nautilus machines Um, I don't know whether they've been modified or whatever but they feel like they just don't give you a break even if the even if the eccentric is extended and in some cases, that might feel like a bit of a rest on like a medex piece, for instance, like a chest press. Sure, um, sure. But I just didn't get that feeling. I just was like, when is this going to end? You know? <laughs> yeah. So see, that's, that's, that's interesting you bring that up from a, um, a varying protocols perspective and usage of varying protocols perspective. I'm not sure if, if Luke has talked to you about this before, but I know he shares the same belief as I do. Um, one of the single biggest components – or contributing factors to client retention when it comes to an exercise perspective, I firmly believe, I know Luke firmly believes, is continuing to vary up the prescription so the client avoids like stagnation and frankly boredom. And so that is one of the, the biggest strengths, in my opinion, of the Discover Strength model and what we did there and what they're continuing to do there is that um, on a regular basis, we change up the client prescription. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt, research has proved this for a long period of time, that we could do the same 12 exercises in the same speed of movement every time you come in for the next 6,000 workouts until the day you die. And we would get wonderful results. Okay. However, the piece that we miss is that what the client is experiencing, if we go that route, is boredom. They like it for a while, and frankly, they get bored, which honestly, just by like describing it that way, it kind of bores me. So that's why I think what we understand that one of the biggest contributing factors to client retention is continued variability of the exercise prescription. Okay, now that doesn't mean like go out tomorrow and encourage your clients to do CrossFit, but within an evidence-based practice, within the evidence-based umbrella, vary up the prescription using different repetition durations because you know you can receive the same benefit by doing that and it it makes your clients happier um and and too often we see people wanting to fight that and say no no no, it has to be this way it has to be these 12 exercises and it has to be a 10 10 case and the evidence again simply doesn't support that and if you can understand that mentality and adopt that it's going to drastically improve client retention client experience and um, ultimately client satisfaction 
Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. And um, certainly something I'm thinking about um, as I start my own uh, facility here in, in Galway in Ireland. Um, that's really useful for me to know in terms of understanding, you know, obviously how to um, keep clients excited, motivated uh, over the long term and, and, and ultimately getting better client retention as a result of that. Um, now, obviously, you, 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 know, you served at Discover Strength uh, for a long period of time. Served sounds like you were in the military. <laughs> um, and and you, yeah, were the, yeah. you, you were there, which, which uh, may, it may be quite akin to, you know, if it's run, being run by Luke, maybe it is a bit um, like the military sometimes. I mean that in, I mean that in the, the good way. Um, sure, but, sure. But obviously, you were uh, operations director there. Um, you know, lots of people listening, obviously running strength training businesses of all shapes and sizes. Have you got any tips that come to mind, um, some core principles that you implemented and that worked for you to run a successful operation? Yeah, yeah I absolutely do. Yeah, sorry, I think I you cut out a little bit there, but if I understand correctly, tips for running a successful operation, is that correct? That's right, yep. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I, I really do. I mean, we could talk, Lawrence, ad nauseum for hours on end about the different principles and, and business philosophies and things you could do, but if it's up to me, or oh, if I can boil it down to you, I would say when you're running a, a personal training or a, a strength training organization, um, the, the very first thing you need to do is make sure that your trainers can provide a consistent experience across the board and that they all are performing at a very high level. And one of the simplest ways to do this, and I think, um, or actually I know, Luke and I actually did a um, – a Facebook Live on this when we were promoting the Resistance Exercise Conference, but I, I can't overstate enough, and that is have an exercise menu, okay? And what an exercise menu is, is it's literally every single exercise that you do in your facility detailed out with the four or five or maybe it's eight coaching points on how you do that given exercise, okay? Now, a lot of people are probably thinking, well, that's so rudimentary, that's so simple, Okay, I can just teach the person, they'll remember it forever. But the reality is, and we had about 30 trainers um, when I left Discover Strength, the reality is that you can teach it to them one time, but as soon as you teach it to them and then they go, they go to apply it, it's probably not going to be at the same level that you taught it to them. Like There's going to be a, a learning curve there, and, and in order to overcome that, you have to have something they can go back to, a very objective reference, and that being the exercise menu. That also increases your ability to hold somebody accountable. To give you an example, if I taught you, Lawrence, how to do leg extension, how we do it at Discover Strength, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and then I walk into the facility, and you're doing it a different way. Well, as opposed to me just coming up to you and saying, hey, you're supposed to do it this way. Don't you remember I told you that, which is very subjective. I can go up to you and say, Lawrence, don't you remember the exercise menu? These are the five bullet points. This is how you're supposed to do it here. Please fix it and, and do it that way. And it becomes a very objective evaluation and accountability tool. And I promise that when you start to not only build that pro or that process, the exercise menu, but then use it as an accountability tool to hold people accountable to the standard that you want your exercises performed at, it will increase the um, quality of your workouts almost instantaneously and actually take a ton of stress off the manager or the leader of the facility um, it, off their plate because they won't have to be like constantly remembering how to do everything. If they forget, which is very normal, just go back to the exercise menu, reference it, and, and, and teach your staff around that. So that's one of the, the, the biggest pieces I, I would I say that. is have an exercise menu and use it as an accountability tool. Again, uh, most people or a lot of people out there are probably thinking that's too rudimentary. Our people know how to do it. But I promise you, if you implement that and you take the time to build that thing out and detail it, um, it will pay dividends in the long run. Even I, in, in not, not even just the long run, in the short term, in, in the immediate, it'll it'll improve the quality of your exercises and your workouts and your facility. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm stealing that. <laughs> so is yeah, it, is absolutely. It because I'm thinking you could do, uh, you could make this online if you wanted to. You could literally have a, a reference website, um, which staff and sure. even, even, uh, trainees, um, could, could reference just to remember how to perform exercises. 
um, and, a, and then a handout as well. Would you? Where would you have it? Would you have it like on the wall or in a handout? Like what format? So, so ours at Discover Strength, we run or we ran when I was there almost everything through the Google platform. So we just had a, a Google document literally called the exercise menu. And I think it was like 20 some pages long because we have a lot of equipment in our four facilities. Um, and we would just use that as a, as a reference. And then when we'd edit it, we'd only, you know, have one or two people that could have the permissions to edit it. They'd make a few changes and then introduce it all to the staff if we did make a change. And then we'd change it, obviously, how we executed company-wide. So that was the best place um, that I found it uh, to be useful because anybody can look at it any time. Um, but, yeah, I mean, a, a website or something that you um, – some online source that you can reference would, would be great and serve that same purpose as well. Um, I would just make sure that if you're going to do it and host it online or something like that, that you allow yourself the ability to make changes to it um, because if you get a new machine or you go to a conference and learn a really cool new exercise that you want to bring home and uh, implement, then you have the ability to do that with ease as opposed to making it a pretty arduous process, which is just unnecessary. Do you know what? Luke could say Set up like a web store, right? Via DS or another site, and sell that as a PDF. And I guarantee you, strength training entrepreneurs would pay good money for that, <laughs> rather than creating their I, own I, menu. <laughs> I 100% agree with that. I, I 100% agree. Absolutely. I bet. I mean, if he, he doesn't do that stuff like that already, does he? I don't think. I know he's involved in a number of things, but. Um, yeah, I, I, I am not aware of him doing anything like that. I know we briefly discussed it uh, when I was there. We, we discussed a few ideas around there, but ultimately we decided to stay focused more so on just growing the business of Discover Strength, not trying to sell you know other ancillary items, albeit yeah. those could be very good revenue streams. Yeah, that's clever. Uh, and I know, Luke, and, and you're very, very focused. Um you know, on that stuff. So yeah, obviously makes, makes a lot of sense to, to focus on the, the primary business, uh, at sure. the moment. um, but yeah, I'm just, I bet you, I mean, you guys, uh, Luke must have, um, tons of content like that, which you've developed as part of the, um, yeah, over, over the years, uh, experience, um, sorry, let me rephrase, um, that you've developed over the years training clients. So lots of, lots of useful content that you've made, um, which you could literally sell as like, um, or, or DS could sell as a massive bundle <laughs> to, uh, sure, to strength yeah, training absolutely. entrepreneurs. Maybe you can sell it at the conference, who knows? Um, but, but, uh, but no, that just come to mind because that's the way my brain works sometimes. Um, is there, sure. is there anything else, Brandon, like, uh, in terms of like your role as ops director, like any other tips you've got? Um, that, I mean, that's an excellent one, but is there anything yeah, yeah. further? Yeah. So, so I, I have a, a bunch, as I've mentioned earlier, but I, I'd probably give you two big ones. One is more of a concrete thing, just like the exercise menu. And one is more, I would say, management philosophy. So let's start with the other concrete thing. And again, this is going to seem very rudimentary, um, but I, I promise you this and the exercise menu are two of the, the biggest keys to the successful workouts that we delivered and they continue to deliver at Discover Strength time in and time out again. And that is a formalized shadowing process. Okay. And what I mean by that is literally the manager sitting or standing and watching a workout and giving that trainer a very objective evaluation of how that workout went um, and saying, hey, th this is these are the exercises you did. This is what you did well. This is where you can improve. And when we did that, we would always give a very, very simple rating system. We used a plus, literally like a plus sign that meant, hey, you did great on this given area. Um, you, you execute on this 95% of the time or more. Okay, a plus slash minus, which meant, hey, you're kind of there, you're kind of not, you have to improve in these areas, and we give them very tangible areas. Or a minus, meaning this is not up to par, you have to improve this instantaneously and, and get better in this immediately. And um, you, you can vary up the frequency of that, um, and we change the frequency of it based on the, um, the length of time the trainer had been with the organization. So if you've been there 10 years, you're not going to get nearly as shadowed or shadowed nearly as frequently as someone who's been there, you know, two months. Um, but regardless of the fact of your tenure, um, you still are being shadowed and giving continual feedback on your progress, or excuse me, um, how well you're doing 
with the client in front of you. Um, and we found that that prevents what I would call uh, professional stagnation in that, um, you know, trainers been here eight years and they're like, yeah, you know, I've done this. I've trained thousands and ten, thousands and thousands of people. I understand how to do that. But then all of a sudden someone's shadowing them and gives them three pieces of feedback that they can improve on. And it really changes the game and creates, the, uh, allows them to continue to focus on their craft. Because you know this, um, and I used to tell this to our staff all the time, is every opportunity or every um, workout with a client, every time you engage with them, is not just an opportunity to retain them, but it's an opportunity to lose them. Like, if you are not on top of your game, they might say, you know what, this isn't for me. This is a very competitive landscape. I'm going elsewhere. And and it, it could be as simple as one you know, not so great workout and the client decides to, to leave. The, the, the term for this that we use a lot was inspect what you expect. Okay. So you expect people to give great workouts, but have some sort of system. We use shadowing, um, to inspect what you expect of them. Another term you could say is trust, but verify. Trust that they're going to do their job. But verify it on occasion. And if they're doing great, use it as an opportunity to build them up. If you watch a great workout and you say, hey, there was absolutely nothing wrong with that, your direct report or your trainer is absolutely going to love hearing from the manager that, hey, that was an incredible workout. Great job doing that. Continue to uh, continue to do a great job. So th- that would be the, the second piece I would give you is, first of all, the exercise menu. But secondly, have some sort of formalized system. We called it literally shadowing because that's what it was for evaluating your trainers on an ongoing basis and making sure that the, the workouts they're delivering are, are up to par with the standards that you expect in your facility. Yeah, that's that's really really awesome. Um, was there anything else you're going to add, or is that was that all you had planned? Because um, that that's brilliant. But I, I didn't know if you had. I think you might mention you had something else to add as well. Sure, sure. Yep. The, the other piece that I would give you, and again, I'll say this is one more time. I feel like a broken record. I could give you a ton of these, but the other piece I would give you, this is more of a, a managerial uh, philosophy of mine, and really just great managers in general. Is I believe that there's two key things when it comes to managing anybody that you have to do. And the the first one is setting expectations clear. Okay. So if you have an expectation of a trainer, it is your responsibility as a manager, as a leader to make sure that that person understands your expectations. Okay. Um, And it's your job to then communicate that to them. And that's, that's the other piece is understand um, that communication and communicating well is one of the most important uh, tools in the world when it comes to managing somebody. So I would say manage expectations and set expectations clear. And then as you traverse your manager relationship with them, make sure that you are constantly communicating well with them and um, going as far to re-communicate and um make sure that they understand your expectations because if you can make sure those two things are well, they'll never most often than not, I should say, I should never say never, but most often than not um, encounter an issue when it comes to if they did something wrong, you have to hold them accountable or whatever it may be. You can say, no, no, I set this expectation clear. I communicated you along the way. You understood what you had to do and you either hit that objective or you, you failed it. So that's more of a a managerial perspective is just saying that if you can nail those two things, you will be, um, a far better leader and manager than in my humble opinion, majority of leader and managers, not only in our space, but frankly, uh, in, in any business. I think that when, when leaders and managers fail or make mistakes or have frustrations, more often than not, it comes back to either poor communication on their part or the fact that they didn't set expectations clear enough yeah, for that's their, a, their, their manager or, their, or excuse me, their direct report. So. Yeah, that's a, sorry, sorry to chop there, Brandon. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great piece of advice. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and it's, it's just occurred to me we could have done a whole episode um, and, and probably multiple episodes on your experience as an operations director and uh, maybe we can do something like that in the future. Um, yeah. What, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, that some of the listeners will know, um, you know, you've moved on from Discover Strength and what, what's the future got in store for you? What, what do you, what, what do you plan on doing next? Do you know? 
Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, I would absolutely love, like a, a long-term goal of mine is to, to, to be a president, or if you want to use the term CEO, uh, of a small company, uh, you know, a $3 million to maybe $15 million company. Now, that's a big range, but that's really where I feel like my sweet spot is going to be. Um, do I think that's going to be my next step realistically? Probably not. I'm probably not going to walk up to some business owner tomorrow and say, hey, let me run your company, you know. Um, <laughs> but... Um, that, that is definitely where I'm going to end up and then I'll be somewhere in my career. Um, what I'm focusing on now is one of two things. I am deeply passionate about managing people. I absolutely love to manage um, and lead people. And so I know that I'll have a, uh, or I'm going to be pursuing a managerial role somewhere. Um, I've looked extensively into sales management because I frankly really enjoy sales. Um, but I've also looked into operational management specifically in the manufacturing field because I think that um, ma- manufacturing is something that has contributed obviously massively and will continue to contribute to the the global economy um, and like help us build the world as we know it. And I just think that that's like a, a great thing to have under your belt and continue to learn from. So when people ask me and I've networked with a bunch of people and they say, well, are you going to stay in the fitness industry and leave no doubt about it. I am unbelievably passionate about fitness and I love it. And if the opportunity presents itself where I, excuse me, where I can stay in the industry, uh, I would definitely um, explore that. But I'm definitely looking outside of the industry as well. And then I always get the question, well, what industry are you passionate about? Or what, what do you want to do? And I answer that question with what I'm passionate about, as I touched on at the beginning, is managing people. I love to lead and manage people. And I can find that in a plethora of industries, if not every single one of and it's not every single one of them. Um, now, there's certain industries that just like don't interest me. And I'm like, I don't. I would definitely not do that. I would definitely not do this. But um, across the board, regardless of the, or excuse me, with the exception of those couple that are def- definite no's for me, um, I've uh, I've looked far and wide to, to to different industries as well. So to answer your question a little more succinctly, I'm going to look. I'm going to be in a managerial role either sales or operational management, um, and whether it's in the fitness industry, fitness industry or not yet, I'm not sure, but if the opportunity presented itself to stay within the industry, I will. Um, and then potentially down the road, this is not going to be my next step, maybe somewhere down the road I'd pursue entrepreneurship and maybe opening a, a small gym of my own, um, but that's not uh, that's not, not the next step for me either. Awesome. Well, you know, Wish you, wishing you best of luck in the future with all your future endeavors. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure I speak for many uh, when I do hope you stay in the fitness industry because we need people like you. Um, you know, you're, you're clearly an exceptional business professional uh, and you're someone who I would say, you know, quote unquote, gets it, you know, when it comes to fitness and strength training. Um, so, I uh, hope you hope you do stay, but also understand that uh, that might not be where your journey ends up. But um, just that you're still passionate and will remain passionate about fitness and potentially doing your own thing in that space in the future is um, is very positive to hear. So, no, so- sounds good. Um, Brandon, what's the best way people to find out more about you and and kind of I guess follow your progress? Sure, absolutely. Well, if you ever want to reach out to me directly, feel free and do that. My email is just my last name, Yonker, J-O-N-K-E-R, B as in Brandon, at gmail.com. And you can feel free and share that if you want. Otherwise, um, very much opposite of my generation, the millennial generation, um, I am not a huge social media person. However, I do uh, spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. Um, if I'm going to have my outlet, it's on LinkedIn. So I'd love to link in with anybody and connect with anybody. Um, of course, you know, Skype chat or anything like that is always good for me as well. So email, LinkedIn um, would probably be the, the two best ways to, to get a hold of me directly. So. Cool. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll definitely put both of those on the show notes. Uh, you might regret that, putting your email out there because you might get thousands of emails. But <laughs> uh, That's all right. I'll do do my best to handle it. No, I'm kidding. I'm not that popular. Um, Maybe you'll get one or two. I I really think you are. And again, a testament to you. You have done an absolutely incredible job really bringing this community together and uh, really finding a a niche within the um, the industry. And so I I just want to thank you again for having me and really for what you've done for this industry um, and what you continue to do. Because you're, uh, I mean, even when we met, Heaven, was it three, 
four years ago now when we met in, <laughs> in London. Uh, I think you were just getting rolling with this. Um, and now look where you've come in the last four years. So it's, it's incredible what you've done and, and I really appreciate everything you've done for the industry, Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you, Brendan. I, I obviously really appreciate that. Um, that's really, really nice of you to say. Uh, and for all of the listeners and uh, to find the blog post for this episode, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Brandon. That's B-R-A-N-D-O-N. Um, and to find the uh, list of all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash podcast. And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook to get your free high intensity training Google sheet to track your training progress and get my ebook with 20 interview transcripts with some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Bill Day Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss and overall health in an efficient, effective and sustainable way. Head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook now and enter your email address for instant access. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and into Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field.